I'm Amelia Mosley and you're watching BTN. Thanks for joining us. Let's see what's coming up. We learn about Australia's plans for Antarctica. Listen to the sounds of sea creatures. And it's time to clean up the country. All that soon. But first today to the biggest story in the news right now, Ukraine. For the past few days, you might have seen some pretty upsetting images on the news after Russia invaded the country. It's made people around the world sad and angry, and many countries have responded by bringing in sanctions. Jack found out what that means. After months of tension and talks came the moment many had feared. Ukraine is under attack. Explosions were heard across the country before sunrise. I decided to conduct a special military operation. Not long after this announcement, Russian troops crossed the border into Ukraine and explosions were heard in cities around the country. Oh, I tell you what, I just heard a big bang. There are big explosions taking place in Kiev right now. It's scary. We didn't believe that this situation would come. Shattered, shattered, not for myself, not, I don't care about my own safety, I just, I care about Ukraine. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, said the military operation was about protecting people in regions of Ukraine that he has chosen to recognise as independent. Lots of people in these regions speak Russian and have close cultural ties with Russia. And these parts were already controlled by groups loyal to Russia. But most people in Ukraine and around the world saw this as an unprovoked attack and an invasion of a democratic country. What we have heard today are not just missile blasts, fighting and the rumble of aircraft. This is the sound of a new Iron Curtain, which has come down and is closing Russia off from the civilised world. Ukraine's president says the country will fight back. He's declared martial law, which means the military takes control over day-to-day -day running of the country. And he's asked for anyone who knows how to fight to join the Ukrainian army. Meanwhile, leaders around the world spoke out against Russia. This invasion is unjustified. It's unwarranted, it's unprovoked, and it's unacceptable. I'm driven to conclude that Putin was always determined to attack his neighbour, no matter what we did. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. But they said they won't send soldiers to Ukraine. Instead, they'll bring in sanctions. In concert with our allies, we will agree a massive package of economic sanctions. So, what is a sanction? Well, it's basically a way of punishing a country, a business or even an individual. Usually by taking away their ability to trade, travel or do business in other countries. As you probably know, most countries rely on being able to buy, sell and travel to and from each other and stopping that can have a big impact on their economies. The idea is that by hurting them economically, sanctions can change the country's behaviour without having to go to war. So far, a whole bunch of countries, including the US, Australia, along with the UK and EU, have brought in sanctions against Russia, which include blocking some trade and stopping some banks and some powerful Russian people, including Vladimir Putin himself, from doing business in other countries. Germany has decided to hold back on certifying a huge pipeline that was set to deliver Russian natural gas. And leaders say there could be more sanctions to come. We have purposely designed these sanctions to maximize the long-term impact on Russia. So, will it work? Well, there's a fair bit of debate about how effective sanctions are. Sometimes in the past, they've had unintended consequences and hurt ordinary people instead of leaders. But this time, many are hoping they'll put pressure on those at the top. Still, some say more needs to be done. Around the world, there have been protests against the invasion, including in Russia, where thousands of people have been arrested at anti-war demonstrations. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, people are doing what they can to stay safe. Some are trying to leave the country or travel to areas where there's less fighting. Others have been sheltering underground in metro stations or wherever they can. 
Many countries, including Australia, have promised to take in refugees and send supplies, while the world watches and hopes for an end to this terrible situation. Of course, the situation in Ukraine is really worrying for a lot of people, but especially people who have friends and family over there. And that includes thousands of Australians. I spoke to some kids to find out more about Ukrainian culture and how they're coping with what's going on. Hi, VTN. My name is Sophia. And my name is Andrew. And we're going to tell you about Ukraine. Ukraine is around many other countries like Russia, Belarus, Poland and some others. And in Ukraine, our grandparents, they live in Lviv and Kaminka Buska. So my mom and dad, they're Ukrainian. All our family is in Ukraine and we were only born in London because um, our parents just moved there. And then we came to Australia and we've been living here for around two years. And we've just gotten a permanent residency in Australia. Yeah. I'm actually really happy because we might soon buy a house. I want to get a dog but he wants to get a cat so uh, I don't know what my mom's going to say about that. It's, it's very nice in Ukraine. There's lots of old buildings, statues museums and there's a lot of good chocolate and cafes. We also really like to go skiing when it's winter because there's lots and lots of snow. The traditional clothing in Ukraine would be wishabanki, which are white shirts sometimes which are embroidered with different patterns. <laughs> yeah, we speak Ukrainian. We don't do it fluently, but we know a lot of words. Yeah, well, so we have Ukrainian lessons. We say hi in Ukrainian, privit, um, and things like yes, ta, and che, no, near. It's like a secret language for us because not many people in our school will know it, and we can just um, talk to each other and nobody will understand. And there's also Ukrainian dancing. Some Ukrainian dancing for boys would be hopak, where they go like, um, they stand in the road and they kick their legs up. In London, um, our family would always come to London and we would always come to them. And now, unfortunately, we can't go back because it's war in Ukraine. My granddad, we speak to him like a half an hour ago and he said that he woke up because um, a bomb has fallen in um, three kilometers away from the house and the house started shaking. So now they're starting to pack up all the important things like their documents and stuff and they're gonna leave to Poland. Some family in Ukraine can't leave because they have a house, they have a dog, they have a car. We also have a great great grandmother and she can't walk because she had a stroke. Our family is feeling a bit scared because they don't know what's going to happen. It makes me um, feel a bit sad and angry because we won't be able to go back and see all our family and everybody there. I really do miss my grandparents and since of all the war thing and COVID, it, we, we don't know when we're actually going to come back and see them again. We hope that um, all our grandparents and everybody we know it will be safe there and that the war will clear up um, and we're hoping that peace gets a chance. Now, if you're worried about what's happening in Ukraine or anything else in the news, make sure you talk to someone like a parent or a teacher about it. You can also head to our website to find tips on how to deal with upsetting news. So make sure you check that out. Now we're heading to southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales, which have been hit by really bad floods. They've damaged homes and businesses and forced hundreds of schools to close. Leela can fill you in. The rain started last week and it just kept coming. Over the weekend, Brisbane, Gympie and parts of the Sunshine Coast got around half their annual rainfall all at once. The last few days have been crazy with all the torrential rain. 
it has been a bit scary at some points, especially on Sunday when it bucketed down. We had lots of water flowing through the property and we had a few water leaks in the house. People have died in the floodwaters and homes, businesses and other buildings have been badly damaged. Thousands of people have had to evacuate. Those who can have been told to stay home. In Brisbane, hundreds of schools were shut. I was a bit sad when I heard that school got cancelled, but at the same time I was very happy because I got the day off. The rain bomb, as it's been called, has been moving slowly south, and people in New South Wales' northern rivers region were also told to evacuate. In Lismore, people attempted to escape the city's worst ever flood by sheltering on their roofs. Emergency services have been working hard to keep people safe, and authorities are warning people to stay away from floodwaters as the wet weather continues. Now to one of the most extreme places on our planet, Antarctica. The Aussie government is planning to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on Australia's Antarctic Territory. Hmm, let's find out about its plans and the treaty that protects the frozen continent. Yes, this will do. <clears throat> Beautiful pretty cold, dry and windy continent. I claim you for him. <laughs> Who are you? Well, I'm here to claim it. <laughs> but you can't because, like, I'm claiming it right now. Um, um, uh, I actually claim this place first. What? No, 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 no. I claim it first. What do you mean? No, I came to claim Hello. it. Hello. Oh, where did you come from? Norway. No, 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 that's I, not what I... No, why are you here? I, like, I don't understand. I, don't I was the one who was in the thing. Okay, guys. Okay, everybody just chill out. <laughs> Good one. We can't all claim Antarctica. Can we? Well, in a way, yes, they can. And they kind of did. You see, for more than a hundred years, explorers from around the world have been, well, exploring this icy continent. But for a lot of that time, there were arguments about who owned what. Oh yeah, we call that San Martin land. Well, the Americans call it Palmer Peninsula. Guys, it's literally called Graham's land. Do you, you guys know Graham? Who's Graham? I, I know a Graham. You don't know Graham? In fact, things got a bit, um, heated down here for a while. There were warplanes, warships and a few international court cases. But eventually, cool heads prevailed. And in 1959, 12 countries signed a treaty. OK, so we all agree, free use of all of Antarctica for science only. Yep, I like it. I and like it. we all share the info. Cool, um, but how do we feel about weapons testing and military stuff? I think it's a no. <laughs> yeah, no. Heaps of other countries have signed on since, but only a few claim parts of Antarctica as national territory. Although only a few countries actually recognise the claims. Australia actually claims the most, about 42%. We have permanent research stations where scientists and engineers can stay and work and learn all sorts of things, like how climate change has affected the planet over hundreds of thousands of years. But now scientists are about to see a lot more activity down here. We'll have unmanned aerial vehicles. We'll have a fleet of drones. We'll have eyes on Antarctica. The Aussie government's putting about $800 million towards our country's presence in Antarctica. It says it'll help us explore more of the continent and protect it from any countries that might want to use it for anything other than science, like fishing or mining. Because while countries have been working together down here for years, there are worries some of them want to see the rules of the treaty relaxed. They don't share the same objectives as Australia, as a, as a treaty um, nation, when it comes to protecting Antarctica. And some reckon Australia is trying to stake out its claim, just in case the treaty ever fails. But most, including the people who work down here, hope that doesn't happen, and Antarctica remains a peaceful place for cool scientific discoveries. Oh, I found a penguin egg. Who um, wants some? Oh, I think, uh, I think we agreed not to eat those, Norway. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if you should... Hey, oh, no, 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 no
Now to another strange and amazing place, underwater. You probably know there are some pretty wild creatures that live in lakes, rivers and oceans. But did you know they also make some pretty wild noises? Amal found out why researchers are trying to collect them to build a library of underwater sounds. Aquaman, swift and powerful monarch of the ocean. Oh no, Aquaman, we've got trouble. Don't worry, I've got it. I'll get my sea pals to help. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? <coughs> Sorry, my paddle crabs are a bit rusty. Yeah, unlike Aquaman, you might not think a lot about the sounds that are made by these guys. But marine scientists do. So, like, all these underwater animals, they make noises? Yes, yeah, and um, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of animals that make noise. So you've got animals like the bearded seal. They produce this, um, what they call a spiralling trill. It sounds like it's come from uh, a space TV programme. It is so odd. This is Dr. Miles Parsons from the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And he says the oceans are full of weird and wacky sounds. A paddle crab, for example, sounds like this. This is a strict scanard and a red piranha. What is your favourite fish out of curiosity? So in terms of sound, my favourite fish is the mulloway. Okay, it's, yeah. It is so loud. If you were to be right next to it, your chest would be in pain and your ears would hurt. It's very loud. If you had to try, what would a mulloway fish sound like? <laughs> okay, fine. You, you are <laughs> the only person I will do this for. <laughs> so it, it sounds, it's a, it's a bah, bah kind of sound. Miles says they make sounds for all sorts of reasons. For example, attracting a mate or warding off predators. And studying those noises can tell researchers a lot. So you can use it to get an idea of the animals that are in a certain place. You can use it to monitor the migration paths of animals like the whales. Now, Miles is leading a project to get all those aquatic sounds into one spot. It's the Global Library of Underwater Biological Sounds, or as we've affectionately called it, GLUBS. He says GLUBS will be a huge help to researchers. We're able to get a much better idea of how um, the soundscapes change in different places. This will help scientists track the effects of things like climate change and identify species. Miles reckons there are a lot of fish sounds out there that we haven't identified. For example, have a listen to this mystery fish that he recorded. The call I ended up calling machine gun Hutta Baba Yaga. <laughs> <laughs> That's a reference to this piece of music, plus machine guns. Miles is hoping once the library is up and running, ordinary people will be able to add their own recordings and we'll all learn more about the mysterious and melodious underwater world. So I just feel like the kids would want me to ask you if you are Aquaman, if you have his talents, because he can listen to fish. No, unfortunately, I'm not Aquaman. <laughs> I would love, I'd love to be able to stay underwater for so much longer. Can you guess which sea creature is making this noise? It's this one, the Boken Toadfish. Liverpool have won the English Football League Cup after a tense penalty shootout. The game finished in a nil-old draw and it took 21 penalty kicks to decide the winner. This is Liverpool's ninth EFL Cup win, the most in history. How's this for your first game ever? And she has kicked it! Parramatta's Matty Studden slotted this field goal in the last 30 seconds of their game against Newcastle in round one of the NRLW. It was actually a debut game for both teams who are new to the NRLW this year. 
Finally, it was a history-making weekend in the AFLW. Carlton superstar Darcy Vessio became the first AFLW player to kick 50 career goals. Vessio gets the milestone. Meanwhile, Brisbane booted the highest AFLW score ever, smashing West Coast 98 to 24. This week, a lot of you will be getting out into the playground, into parks and out onto the street to pick up rubbish. That's because it's Clean Up Australia Day and organisers say this year's event will be more important than ever. Amal found out why. So guys, how's your day been today? Rubbish. Full of rubbish. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. No, we pick up rubbish for Clean Up Australia Day. Ah, oh, that makes way more sense. Yep, it's that time of year when people around the country slip on their gloves and grab some garbage. Clean Up Australia Day was started back in 1989 by a man named Ian Kiernan who was out sailing and noticed a lot of pollution. He decided the Sydney Harbour needed a serious clean-up and asked locals to help out. Sydney Harbour belongs to the people. We want to lift the public awareness. There was even a groovy song to promote it. From there, it's grown to be a national annual event. And schools play a big role with their own school's cleanup day. Cleanup Australia Day is a day where you take care of the environment from all the rubbish. So less rubbish goes to the sea. I like to pick up rubbish because it's safe for the environment and it helps the sea animals and land animals. It's important to pick up rubbish so then nothing bad happens to the world so then it stays healthy. This year, organisers are also asking volunteers to unmask effects of a relatively new type of rubbish. Masks. Sometimes I find them around the street or the park and mostly at the beach. 30,000 masks are used in this very school every month. Ever since the pandemic started, well, there's been a lot of mask action. And while they're great at keeping people safe, it makes for heaps of waste, which isn't great. It takes up to 450 years for them to break down. So, you know, they really don't belong in the environment. That's Pip Kiernan, Ian Sora and the Clean Up Australia chair. This year, she wants people to become citizen scientists and count the masks they pick up as they go about their cleanup. The next generation of these um, PPE products really could be vastly improved on in terms of being designed not only to keep us as safe as possible, but also to be designed so that they have the environment in mind. And it's not just masks. Pip says the pandemic has led to a big increase in all sorts of rubbish. Unfortunately, with COVID, our habits did change and these weren't kind for the environment. So we've used a lot more single-use items, sanitised wipes, single-use face masks, takeaway food packaging because we're not eating in restaurants. And in fact, it's 130,000 tonnes of plastic waste um, gets into the marine environment every year in Australia. That's a lot of litter. That's why Clean Up Australia says as well as cleaning up all this waste, the best thing we can do is try and make less of it in the first place. We can stop using plastic covered foods and we can use nude foods. We can make things out of not plastic but different materials. Oh, awesome work. Well, that's all we have for you today, but we'll be back before you know it. And if you miss us in the meantime, you can jump online to check out more stories and quizzes and tell your teachers to check out our resources as well. Oh, and don't forget, Newsbreak is here every weeknight with all the latest news to keep you up to date. Stay safe, everyone, and I'll see you next week. Bye.